Oops, sorry, just a moment. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, briefly is what is uh, this thing that we're calling Polaris Media, and then we'll move into some uh, examples uh, where I'll I'll do a um, I'll use the Polaris Media to simplify a valve. So, but it, it can work across a lot of different other types of flow restrictions. I'll just picking a, a valve in particular. Then uh, I'll look at an electronic cooling example, specifically a heat sink, and then uh, also we'll use Porous Media in like a HVAC example where I'll, I'll use it to basically simplify an air, uh, entire air conditioning unit. So, um, so what is this uh, Porous Media anyway? Uh, the the idea behind Porous Media is it's simply a material containing pores. I know it sounds obvious, but uh, here are some. Um, here's one example of a perforated plate. Or I call these pores in this plate, all these little holes. We could use that. We could use porous media to simplify that, or things like filters. Uh, we can also use porous media to simplify. But in this, in the context of this presentation, actually, um, I'm going to use the porous media for a little bit uh, of a different purpose to simplify things like valves or heat sinks and so on. So, uh, and those components that I'm really looking at don't necessarily contain uh, what I'm, what we're typically calling pores. Um, now, if you are interested in more information on how you can simplify porous structures like these though uh, there is a, uh, a knowledge base article you may want to jot down and, and look up it'll it'll walk through um, how you can simplify those uh, common porous type structures but uh, again for this presentation I'm going to use porous media uh, as a flow modifier okay so that what I mean by that is when fluid passes through what I define as a porous media the fluid will be changed in some specified way in the cases uh, I'll be looking at I'll, I'll be uh, changing the pressure, basically creating a pressure drop across the porous medium, or also uh, changing the temperature. Uh, I'll, I'll take heat out of the air, or or put a heat into the air, depending on how um, how it how it should transfer if it's an air conditioner or heat sink. Okay. So uh, the first example I like to like to look at with you then is uh, a valve. So with uh, any kind of flow restriction. Uh, usually you'll have some sort of pressure drop. Uh, in this case, I have a orifice plate and pressure, higher pressure upstream, lower pressure downstream. Other examples, though, if I have a constant pressure source, you'd see a lower flow rate going through uh, larger pressure drop uh, regions. Where there's a large restriction, there's lower flow. Where there's smaller restrictions, larger orifice, there's larger flow. So there's sort of a relationship, it seems, between the pressure and the uh, flow rate. Um, other types of restrictions uh, are a little more subtle, like just a bend. A 180 degree bend creates sort of a restriction. It causes a pressure drop. Um, anything which instigates turbulence typically uh, may cause these pressure drops. And, and one, of my, one of my favorite examples uh, that really clearly links uh, force, pressure, and flow rate together is a syringe. When you push on the syringe, uh, depending on how restricted it is, it's going to push out fluid at a large flow rate or a very small flow rate. Now, uh, an example I'm going to look at, though, I'm going to take a look at a valve, okay? So this valve does look like very porous, but it doesn't need to be so. It's just uh, the porous media, I think, will apply best to uh, this kind of example. So uh, just by looking at it, you can kind of see how this valve might be intended to operate. When I close it, uh, um, uh, it, I'll just be screwing it downward. And when it's fully open, the fluid will go through all these holes. So to run the simulations, first... I'll, uh, I'll run the simulations on the original geometry. Okay, I'll run a, a batch of simulations on the original geometry to try to get the what, try to figure out what's the right answer, what's the uh, flow rate through the valve, what's the pressure drop. Then I'll create a porous media that mimics that right answer. So I'll basically take this geometry and simplify it down to uh, just a cylindrical body in this case that the flow will be allowed to go through. And then I can use that porous media for future studies. Okay, which will be a lot faster. Okay, so here I'm simplifying the valve down to porous media, or we're simplifying the uh, uh, filter, in this case, down to porous media, all in the same study. So to begin with that, um, here's the uh, valve example I'm going to take a look at. The, uh, uh, I noticed a lot of you were, were new to CFD, so I'll spend a little bit of time on uh, some of the setups so you can, you can get a better understanding of what, what I'm really doing here. So uh, in this uh, study, which I, in this flow simulation study, which I've already created, I've just simply applied a couple of pressure boundary conditions. Here is going to be the inlet side, okay, and uh, I've applied two bar pressure. It's about two atmospheres. On the outlet side, I've applied one bar. So I've keyed in a pressure drop, and I'm going to solve for the flow rate. Now uh, I have a goal that's set up that's going to monitor that flow rate on the inlet face, okay. Flow rate at the inlet should be equal to flow rate at the outlet. 
And I've also uh, done some mesh refinement. I've applied a what we call a local mesh control here uh, that's just bumping the level of refining cells up to level two. Now, I understand if some of you don't know exactly what I mean by that yet, but we'll, maybe I'll show a couple pictures of the mesh to give you some sense of what we're doing here. But I'm just going to add a little bit of mesh refinement to that region to try to get the right answer. So uh, when I run this study, go ahead and kick off a uh, new run on this study here. Software is going to start off, and it's increasing the flow rate. It's sort of converging to a result. I'm going to have this, I've forcibly told to run for 100 iterations just for consistency with some other studies that I'll be running in a moment. But it looks like it's converging right around, apparently, 8.5 liters per second. So when I have about a one atmosphere or one bar pressure drop across there, I get 8.5 liters per second of, of uh, flow. Okay, and this is water flow, of course. Um, so I just want you, want you to remember that number for just a moment because I'll be comparing it uh, to another number in a moment here. So it is 8.5 initially. Now, uh, how do I know that's the right answer? Well, or is it the right answer? Let me show you what the, what our mesh looked like, okay? So you do see it's a little bit finer in the region of the pores, but it's uh, it's actually very coarse. You see the pore here and then the size of this rectangular cell? The cell is huge with respect to size of that pore. It's not really going to capture that detail. So um, I'll need to do some mesh refinement and maybe rerun the study and see if my result changed. So after I do uh, some mesh refinement, so this is sort of what like my initial mesh looked like. And as I do subsequent mesh refinements, you can see my mesh getting better and better, and it might approximate the result better and better. However, the sacrifice here, of course, is runtime and uh, computer memory. So when I ran all these studies, I got some uh, different results than what I'd shown there. Okay, so here's the study I just showed you, right around uh, what I said, 8.5 roughly. This one only took maybe 20 seconds or so to run. You see down here, it took 20 seconds to get to that number. Okay, But if I did it with a finer mesh and a finer mesh and kept going finer and finer, it takes longer and longer to run. And uh, the, uh, But I, I converge to a result, which the actual, supposedly the right answer in this scenario is actually much closer to 10 liters per second, not 8.5. Okay. So it looks like it takes me about 1,000 seconds to get to the right answer when I'm modeling the geometry directly. Okay, and also from a RAM requirement perspective, um, each of these studies, this study here took about three gigabytes of RAM, six gigabytes, and then 12 gigabytes to run this further study with that really far mesh refinement. I'm, I'm, I only have about 32 gigabytes on my machine, so I'm, I'm getting close to running on RAM if I were to go two more steps, okay. So next, now that uh, I was able to use the uh, uh, flow simulation directly to get to get the right answer on the original geometry. Now I'm going to use porous media to simplify that structure and uh, try to mimic that right answer so I could be able to use that in future studies. Now before I move too much further, just want to just demonstrate how the fluid's moving through the system. Okay, and then I can compare that to the uh, to the porous media as well. I'll show flow trajectories just to get get the picture. So this is with that coarse mesh study that I just ran here. You can kind of see the arrows. I'm not sure how choppy it might come through in the uh, go-to webinar, but you can maybe get a sense of how that's moving. Um, now, if it is uh, choppy at all, if, it, if you can't really tell how that's moving, I'll, 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 what I'll do is let me uh, uh, copy this link. Actually, I have the link uh, back here. And I'll put it in the chat. So if anybody wanted to view the, the video of how this flow is moving through this, then you can, uh, you can grab it right from the chat. Uh, right now, you should be able to pull that up. Okay, so if you wanted to view uh, the, the finer mesh and the, sort of the result of that, you can you could just click on the uh, YouTube link I just sent there uh, in the chat window. Um, all right, so next, what I'll do though is let me uh, let's try to mimic the 10 liter per second result that I got uh, with porous media. So what I've done is I've simplified that valve down to this simple uh, body here. Okay, so let me kind of go back and forth for a moment so you can see, maybe hide. Okay. So here's the original valve and then here's that body, sort of simplifies it. Okay, so uh, 
uh, what I'll do is I'm going to key in a certain, so, so to speak, certain kind of porosity or pressure drop equation into this uh, body so it'll, it'll remove, it'll, it'll restrict the flow in some specified way. It'll change the flow. Now uh, I'll go ahead and create a new, what we call porous medium in my tree here. I'll select the body that I want to treat as a porous media. It'll, by default, it'll disable that component, which basically just means that flow will be allowed to go through it. It won't, it won't block the flow. And then I'll create a new porous body. In here, I'll create a new item. And I'll key in uh, some parameters that describe that body, such as its length and its cross-sectional area. I measured its length to be about uh, 0.02 in this case, which I've just sort of arbitrarily modeled. And its cross-sectional area is... 0.001935, last time I measured it, and that's in cubic meters. Also, I'll key in a porosity. Um, the porosity in this case, uh, all this number is doing is just uh, modifying the velocity. When I key in 0 0.5, for example, for the porosity, it will actually double the velocity when the fluid enters this region. It will double the velocity. It will multiply it by the inverse of this number, basically. Okay. And then now, uh, most importantly, I'll key in an uh, equation that describes how the pressure drops across that body, how it creates a restriction. So I'll enter in a pressure drop versus flow rate. So here I can enter in a table of values, such as uh, at, uh, let's see, at 10 liters per second, I should have a pressure drop of one bar. Okay. Now, really, if I were to do a, uh, a larger pressure drop, the flow rate is going to go up, okay? And this relationship is very commonly a parabola. So what I'll do in order to enter in this parabola, and I'll just do this, uh, uh, we're going to see a lot of parabolas throughout this presentation, so I'll just do this once just to illustrate uh, probably a pretty common way you can do this. Um, I'm going to enter in, uh, in into just Microsoft Excel just a, couple, just a couple of data points that might represent the flow rate. So here's like the flow rate from 0 up to 8. Let me just keep going a little further up to like 10, which is the 10 liters per second. And then how does that relate to pressure drop? Well, um, if I take this column and, and then uh, just create an equation and take this first cell and divide by 10, which is that 10 liters per second, put it in closed parentheses, and then square it to create that parabola, Then now, if I just drag this equation down, you can see it'll match the one of the data points I entered in, the 10, one, 10 liters per second, it's one bar. So it matches that data point, and it should also mimic the behavior for other uh, pressure drops. Now, in order to confirm its parabola, you could run multiple studies on the original geometry. Okay, But again, frequently, I think you'll find that uh, behavior is very parabolic. So I'll grab a few more. I'll go all the way up to 20 here, 20 liters per second, just in case. I'll copy that. I'll get rid of this row and just paste that in here. So after I paste it, there you now you see this relationship has been applied to my new porous media body. And that's pretty much it. So now I'll save this porous media. I'm going to call this uh, fully open valve. This porous media only mimics the fully open position of that valve. And I might, if I wanted to test out other positions, I might I may have to create additional porous media to test out those. So now I'll go ahead and select that fully open valve porous media, apply it to that body. Now I've already got a porous media on there, so let me delete that other one that was already there. I've got the same uh, loads in this case, the same inlet pressure, two bar, same outlet pressure. I got my porous media on there ready to go, and I'm going to monitor the flow rate. So given that pressure drop, I should see a flow rate of about 10 liters per second again. I'll go ahead and run this study. And this one should only take uh, seconds. It's a very simplified uh, version of that original geometry. You see very quickly it approaches up close to the 10 liters per second, a little bit off. Um, really, I should be accounting for um, the, uh, uh, the pressure drop caused by just the pipe as well, which I'm not, I haven't done in that porous media. Um, so that there's a little bit of uh, uh, fudging in there that I, that I may need to uh, also add into this equation. But for, for simplicity and for demonstration purposes, this, I think, shows close enough the principle. Okay. So see, it, it 
almost took about as long to run though. I mean, so what's uh, what's really the, the trade-off here? And let's make sure that it's I'm clear on that. So here was the uh, here was the graph from before when I ran it on the original geometry. Remember, it took about a thousand seconds. And then here's the same kind of convergence graph if I were to do mesh refinement on the porous media version. And you see, really here it converges very quickly. It's uh, I didn't really even need to run all these other studies. Really, it converged right around here, in which only was about what ten seconds. So the time difference between the converged results of both studies is is huge, about a factor of a hundred. In this case, about 100 times faster, requires roughly 100 times less computer resources as well uh, in order to run the uh, model with the porous media instead of with the actual valve geometry. So why, I guess the one, one question I think I know you're probably thinking is why bother with the porous media? You need to figure out what the value of the valve is anyway. Well, the porous media tool is not, uh, is not used typically if you're, if you're only running the simulation on just the valve. Okay, we're, I'm not going to use the porous media on just a single valve analysis. I'll just run that one directly. Really, the porous media tool is used when you need to run a lot of different geometries okay, uh, all together in the same simulation. So if you have a valve, you have a lot of bends, you have other restrictions, and you have maybe filter bodies, um, you're going to simplify it. You can simplify a few of those, a few key ones, as porous media to really speed up that larger simulation. Okay, so um, this should make the the big simulation go a lot faster, a uh, uh, hundred times faster in some regions, but globally maybe not quite a hundred times faster. All right, so the next uh, next example uh, that we'll take a look at is for uh, electronic cooling. It's uh, it'll follow the ve very similar sort of uh, uh, principle that I follow with the valve restriction. But in the electronic cooling example now, I'll have to take into account not just pressure drop, but also heat transfer. So how do we how do we account for that heat transfer with the porous media tool? So uh, just like uh, with the valve restriction example, the, uh, the idea behind even bothering with porous media here is if you have to run a large simulation, there's a lot of complexity in very small region in very small regions of that large simulation, such as in heat sinks, a very common uh, cause for a uh, uh, lot of mesh refinement. They're, they're, heat sinks can be very computationally expensive, so I, I think it's practical to simplify things like heat sinks with, for example, the porous media tool. Now, there's already a few tools that will help you simplify heat sinks. The tool that I've already mentioned, Porous Media, but also there's a tool called Heat Sink Simulations and a tool called Fans, okay, which we can use in conjunction. So really, this to talk briefly about this Heat Sink Simulation tool that's available in Flow Simulation, really this tool is, uh, is nothing more than Fans, the, our Fans tool, plus a Porous Media. So let's take a look at, at one of these. So if I were to use the heat sink tool to simplify the structure you see on the left here, I would just draw a rectangular prism, or technically a parallel pipe, basically a three-dimensional parallelogram. But uh, frequently I'll just draw maybe a rectangular prism. And uh, I'll enter in what kind of fan I want, and I'll enter in what kind of porous media, or in this case they call it heat sink, that I want. So the fan, I'll enter in a fan curve and apply that to sort of the top face, so you see how it sort of uh, sucks in the uh, cool air, the colors represent temperature in this case. And then to the actual body of the heat sink, I'll apply a pressure drop curve. This looks familiar. It's the same kind of parabola I entered in for uh, flow restriction, such as on the valve. And then also I'll enter in, a, in addition to that, that pressure drop curve, I'll enter in a, um, a thermal resistance curve. So you can kind of see the relationship here. When you have a high velocity flowing through the heat sink, it's got very low thermal resistance. It's able to transfer heat quickly. And versus if you have a low velocity, you have a relatively high thermal resistance. It's able, it transfers heat much more slowly to uh, slower velocity fluids. So Now, what if you have a heat sink that doesn't have a fan attached to it? Well, you're not going to use, typically you're not going to use the heat sink tool. For heat sinks that don't have a fan attached to it, we're just going to model that with just the porous media by itself. So I'm going to use porous media to model a free convection heat sink. So just like before with the valve, I'll, uh, I'll try to get the right answer with the original geometry. 
Then I'll simplify it. I'll create porous media that mimics that uh, right answer. And then uh, we can use that porous media again for future studies. So same kind of, again, same kind of approach I, I used on the, the flow valve. So let me just demonstrate a couple of the key steps. All right, so here, um, here's the original uh, heat sink geometry, and there's a, uh, a computer chip underneath it that's providing the heat. Um, in this case, I'll test it as uh, 20 watts. So you see I've, uh, oop, let me turn on the heat sources so we can see the applied heat source. So I turned it off at some point here. All right, so uh, uh, we have, again, the, or excuse me, the aluminum heat sink. We have a 20 watt heat source on the chip. And then the goal here, I'm gonna monitor, I wanna make sure the, I get an accurate temperature reading on the uh, chip. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna tune my, my um, porous media tool to make sure I get the right temperature. I'm looking for the temperature. Um, so again, I've applied mesh refinement. In this case, I've just done a uh, narrow channel, what we call a narrow channels refinement. Total to use a level three narrow channels with four cells. That's just gonna squeeze about four cells in between each one of these fins to make sure I get uh, enough mesh refinement to get, to get at that right answer. So when I run this study, I'll just uh, load the results and sort of show it. This study takes a little while longer to run. I get a result that maybe looks like uh, this. Now gravity, this thing is oriented uh, kind of like this. So up is, you know, up here where hot air is rising up here. Um, so you see the cool air comes in and then gets heated up and rises outward or rises upward. Okay. So now uh, a couple of things I want to take note of uh, as far as how the fluid flows through the heat sink. For one, the fluid does not move freely in the X direction. Look at this X direction here. The fluid's not allowed to move freely in the X direction because the fins are going to block him from moving in the X direction. But it is, the fluid is able to move fairly freely in the Y and Z direction. See, the fluid moves kind of down at an angle, downward in the negative Y, so to speak, and then mostly in the Z direction. So I want to be able to emulate uh, this, um, this behavior. Okay, and I'll do that uh, with the porous media tool in a moment. And also the heat transfer behavior will produce a temperature result in this case, that uh, let me actually look at one of my surface plots to illustrate. Gives me a temperature result right here in the middle. Uh, if I look at my temperature cell, it's right around 86 Celsius. Okay, so it gets up to about 86 Celsius. So I want to make sure I set up my porous media in a way that I get the same 86 Celsius when this thing is producing 20 watts. So to set up that porous media, Take a look at how I've modeled the porous media. Look, notice what I've simplified, what I haven't really simplified. I put the, this blue block up here, represents the porous media, but down here, this bottom plate is like the bottom plate of that heat sink, which is where all the fins rest. So notice I've left that plate in there, okay? But I've just simplified all the fin, that whole fin region with the porous media block, okay? So now, uh, in order to specify this porous media, If I look at its item properties, it looks it looks a little bit intimidating. A lot of a lot of stuff in here. Let me let me break it down a bit. So in the top section here is where I go to define the those same kind of pressure drop versus flow rate relationship. Okay. Now in this case, the flow is not allowed to freely move in the x direction. Okay, but it is pretty freely allowed to move in the y and z direction. So I want to make sure I account for that. So uh, in the, um, what I'll do in order to do that is I'll specify a, a steep relationship between flow rate and pressure, okay, for the x direction of the flow. Then I'll define a more shallow relationships for the y and z direction. So this means that uh, the flow will be allowed to move basically 100 times more freely in the y and z direction than it is able to move in the x direction. Now I'm just trying to mimic the flow behavior, the actual uh, values here aren't too critical. I don't, you know, I don't need to tune these too much to get the right behavior and to get the right answer for this scenario. Now, what I what does require some tuning is the second section here. The second section uh, is 
what defines the heat conductivity. You see the very first item here, heat conductivity and porous matrix. As soon as I turn on that checkbox, this whole section pops up. Um, and in here, pretty simple numbers I've put in here. These are just uh, the uh, conductivity of uh, aluminum, the specific heat of aluminum, the density of aluminum. aluminum. I've just defined the material properties of the, uh, the material of the heat sink. And then down here, this bottom section, the volumetric heat exchange coefficient, this is what requires some of that tuning. And once again, uh, it's just a parabola. Okay. So uh, all, all I need to do is run uh, potentially a couple studies uh, on with the porous media. First, I'll just te I test out some different number, like try testing out a parabola where the heat exchange coefficient is only 100, and then I find out it gets too hot. Then I do uh, 10,000, and it gets too cold. And then I do try 1,000, and it's right on the money. So you just have to tune this parabola up or down, um, which each porous media study is very quick to run, so it's, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do. So after doing that tuning, uh, here's what the result, uh, look how, here's how the result compares. So I'll run a uh, comparison tool to illustrate. So when I compare the results at, at different heat powers, by the way, um, so here, these top three you see are, it's called porous, these bottom three are called heat sink, 20 watts, 20 watts, 40 watts, 40 watts, 30 watts, okay? So the different powers and the different uh, uh, ways that I ran it. So let's, let's take two specifically. So 20 watts porous compared to 20 watts heat sink, that's these two guys, okay? That's the orange line and the red line. It look like, looks like they give me the same final answer right around 86 Celsius. Okay. Compare the 30 watts with the 30 watts and they give me the, about the same answer right around uh, 103 it looks like. And comparing the 40 to the 40, the two blue ones, again almost the, roughly the same answer based on the way I've tuned that parabola. Okay. Now uh, so we see the numbers seem to match up. Uh, if you want to see those same numbers numerically rather than just glancing at a graph, here they are. But um, so again, 86.67 compared to 86.67 versus the 40 watt 119.09 compared to 119.57. Okay. Now uh, the thing is, though, we get to that right answer much faster with the porous media again this time. If I look at this with regard to CPU time, the porous media or uh, takes like all the way down here looks like to me 13 seconds, whereas the uh, the actual one that I ran took if I convert if I say it converged right here about 300 and about 300 seconds, so 13 up to 300 seconds. It's a huge time difference. Now also looking visually at the comparison, um, if I compare this image to that one, apologize if they're not right next to each other, but okay, just highlight those two highlighted images. You see far away from the uh, porous media, the results are about the same. Okay, so right in this region, they look about the same. Uh, locally, right on the heat sink, the results will look a little different. Okay, so locally, the 20 watt and the 20 watt, they look a little different, but the chip is the most important. You see it's red there, it's red there. It's like, it, it looks the same, but I know the scale might not be fully representative. Okay, similar kind of plots for the other ones. Again, far away, if I'm looking at 30 and 30, far away, it looks about the same. Locally, it looks a little different with the porous media. Okay, but they all give me this, about the, the same answer for that, for that CPU chip is the key. Um, all right, so move back. So uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, to, to wrap up that point, though, uh, uh, again, the porous media tool helps you save a lot of time um, for bigger studies. If you want to run the, a larger system, that's where your, the time savings comes into play. So now the, uh, the last example I'd like to take a look at is uh, more of an HVAC example uh, where I'll simplify it using a, uh, a air conditioning. Or excuse me, I'll, sim I'll simplify an air conditioning unit using the porous media tool. So this example uh, is actually one of our, it's one of our, um, it's our Pontiac office um, where we have our training room set up. Okay, we can seat like 12 students in there. So each of these blocks represents a student, okay, which all will be uh, heat generating. Um, so the room can get uh, quite hot unless we cool it. Uh, and then over here in this, across from the, the training lab over here, behind a couple of closed doors, is, a, uh, is our 3D printing lab. Okay, so we have two 
big 3D printers is uh, Stratasys, Fortis, uh, both producing uh, quite a bit of heat. Now the uh, uh, fluid's going to go uh, through our air conditioning unit and come out of the, all of these uh, ports. So let's let's take a look at how some of that uh, set up in a moment. So basically, the procedure I'm going to look uh, look at for running in this study is first I might look up the specs of an AC unit, try to figure out uh, about how many watts or how many BTU that it's capable of uh, removing, and I might test that out inside of this system and see if it works. Okay. Then I'll create a porous media that mimics those specs. So you see this little body here I've circled, a little blue thing. That'll be like the, the entire air conditioning unit model and just into a tiny compact body. And then uh, I can use that porous media further for iterative studies. I can change that wattage around and see if it, uh, see if it changes anything. All right, so uh, notice in a couple questions, we'll get to those a little bit later on here. And then uh, you know, just keep them coming if you like. And then uh, towards the end, we'll have a whole section dedicated to that. So now uh, the, to get into the HVAC example here. All right, so this model has uh, quite a bit of setup. I don't, I don't plan on going through it all, but I'll, maybe I'll try to highlight some of the, uh, uh, some of the important things, some of the little things that are a little different, uh, maybe some of the unfamiliar things as well. Um, so in this model, what, I've, what I'm doing is I'm going to account for, uh, oh, uh, again, the goal here just to keep in mind is uh, to, try to um, try to size the air conditioning unit so that it's able to cool these three rooms and also determine... Uh, how well it cools each room. If uh, if one room gets a little hotter, we might need to implement maybe some sort of control system or may have three separate thermostats uh, that will sort of control each one. So those are the sort of things I want to test out here. Right now, I just have one thermostat in the middle room, um, and we'll we'll see how well that does. So uh, again, far, as far as some of the setup goes, uh, some of the some of the physics that I've included here uh, are, for example, radiation. I'm including thermal radiation. I'm using a method that's available in our what we what call our HVAC module, and uh, it's a method called discrete ordinates. It allows for uh, radiation to pass through tr semi-transparent materials like glass, and those materials will absorb some of the ultraviolet, okay, and also the infrared uh, part of those spectrums. So it'll actually have spectral characteristics that'll absorb some of that. And since this is in the Detroit area, I've modeled, I've specified that location so it knows uh, where the sun's going to be located at 2 p.m. on a hot summer day. This will be, uh, it'll be like 90, I'm going to model it as 90 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And we'll see how well the air conditioner performs in that environment. Then as far as um, uh, some of the other setup goes, uh, importantly the fan, I've specified a, a fan what we call an internal fan that's going to take air from this face and directly transfer it to that face. So whatever the flow rate is here, it's going to model that in here and it's going to match the temperature as well. Also importantly, I've modeled the uh, air conditioning unit as this porous, this little blue body here. Okay. So the way I've set this up is it's going to, uh, well, let me look at the porous media first. It's nothing special here, just to find its length and its area, and then just key in the porosity of one. No special uh, flow rate equation. Really, I just said that it's not going to restrict the flow at all, which is a very tiny number there, very large number, so it's a very shallow relationship. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the porosity of one just means that flow will be able to go through it unobstructed, basically. But really, the key part of the model here that's important to me is the, uh, the way I model the heat transfer. So here's my air conditioning heat transfer. So you see this note is going to take, it's, it's basically subtracting 10 kilowatts, 10,000 watts, or there's 10,000 joules of energy per second that are being removed from the air that's being passed through this air conditioning unit. Now, I've also got this, uh, this wattage. It's, it's turning on and off based on a thermostat. So it's going to monitor the, uh, let me zoom out a bit here. It's going to monitor the temperature in this middle room. So we're gonna, I'm going to have my thermostat uh, located. It's going to matter the temperature in this middle room. And when the temperature gets less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 72 minus 2, when the temperature gets less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the air conditioner is going to turn off. And then when the temperature gets bigger than 72 degrees Fahrenheit, temperature, the thermostat's going to turn the air conditioner unit back on. So it's going to cycle on and off. And we'll see 
after so many cycles, what the what the environment sort of reaches. It'll reach sort of a pseudo steady state. Um, all right, so those are some of the key things. Other other uh, other important things I think to mention up front here is also the, the people are tra all transferring heat 90 watts per person. The Fortis machine is a 3,000 watt heat source, and the uh, Stratus machine is like a 1,500 watt heat source. Okay, notice the way I model the people here as well as I'm not actually simulating with mannequins. Um, so the the radiate the radiative heat transfer rate might not be perfectly accurate based on the way I model, but I think it'll be good enough to to simulate the amount of heat exiting each of their bod bodies. All right, so I think that's all the key stuff. Now uh, this study does take a while to run, so um, quite a while to run. Let me load the results and kind of illustrate what you see out of it. Um, maybe start with uh, some ISO surfaces, <clears throat> or excuse me, a surface plot. Be a little bit more. There we go. So just uh, visually, when you look at just the surface plot, which is just showing the temperature on the exterior walls, um, you can tell one room gets a little hotter than the others. Okay. So just visually, you see uh, higher temperatures in this room. Might need to add a bit more, a bit more cooling. It gets uh, up to it looks like about 80 to 85 cel uh, Celsius, 80 to 85 Fahrenheit. Okay. Whereas these rooms looks like they're sort of in the green, uh, which uh, I know it's a little hard to tell in the colors, but if you take my word, it's right around 70 to 75, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. But I can kind of probe around to see. Um, or if I look at the, uh, if I generate an animation or maybe show how the flow fluctuates, let me just show how it. Uh, fluctuates because I was just looking at one point in time there. But if I show the history, okay, let me just pick out one of these what I'm calling habit zones. These are like little bodies I've created to monitor the temperature in different regions, sort of the the six foot and below region of the room rather than the entire boundary of the room. Uh, so uh, in the case of habit zone number two, which is the middle room, or habit zone number uh, three, which is the side room here, you can see the temperature drops, and then as soon as it goes below some temperature, then it starts uh, oscillating because the thermostat's turning it on and off, on and off, on. And it sort of reaches a pseudo steady state after about 15,000 physical seconds. This is not calculation time. This is uh, sort of like real time, physical time. So 15,000 seconds, how many hours? That's like three to five hours, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, but it does it, it drops below uh, the 70 degrees Fahrenheit only about after less than an hour. Okay, so the cooling rate of this uh, air conditioner is relatively slow. Maybe we need a little bit bigger air conditioner to be able to hit that pseudo steady state faster. Now the other room, the hot room, that <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> anyway, the uh, hot room reaches about 82 to 84 somewhere in that ballpark. Just a moment, get a, <laughs> just get a glass of water. Got a frog in my throat. All right, so got that got that taken care of for a moment. Moment. Um, all right, so next, what I'd like to look at. Um, let's see, where did I leave off? Oh yes, I was going to look at an animation. <clears throat> so, on uh, YouTube here, it's another uh, animation that. Um, that I wanted to show. I'm going to post that into the chat right now. 
and I'll show it on the screen as well. <clears throat> Apologize for the pitch change in my voice for the <clears throat> for the moment. But let's see here. Where's that guy at? Pull that guy up. Output. So this just uh, demonstrates the <clears throat> same thing that that plot was showing. If you take a look at how the flow, how the thermostat cycles, this is a time lapse of about three hours condensed down to thirty seconds. So you can see over the period of that uh, that time there. The air conditioning unit doesn't really cool this room ever. I mean, as you saw in that graph, it was just kind of cycling at around 80, 85 or somewhere in that ballpark. Whereas the other rooms, uh, it's able to cool relatively effectively com by comparison. So again, if the animation looks a little choppy on my screen, you might check out that YouTube link. Should work a bit better there. Um, all right, so that was, uh, <clears throat> again, that was some of the key stuff I wanted to show in this uh, this example here. Um, try to think if there was uh, anything else before I left off there that, uh, that was worth uh, comparing for the moment. But I think that, yeah, I think that about does it. Oh, yeah, uh, one other thing I wanted to show was uh, comfort parameters. Uh, this is also part of the HVAC module, a little less uh, part of the porous media content here. But if I take a look at some of the different comfort parameters available in the HVAC module here, you can see uh, percent of people dissatisfied is what we call this plot, PPD, percent of people dissatisfied. So you see in the middle, um, we have less than 5%. So this is a good good region to be in, apparently. But compare that to being in the uh, the um, our 3D printing lab, where 45, no, no surprise, more than 45% of people might be dissatisfied having to work in there. Um, it's quite, uh, quite hot. So again, like 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Not a very comfortable environment by comparison. Also, we can look at another plot of drought. This is like uh, um, if you feel a draft like on your neck or something, it can be a little annoying. So this drought rate, also part of the HVAC module, <coughs> excuse me, looks at that kind of a property. If I load uh, some different time moments, you can we can compare one moment to another. So uh, we see at one time step, which is sort of, I've picked a time step that's kind of close to just before the, uh, or just after the air conditioner turns on, a little bit after it. So you see the drop is, uh, it's pretty uncomfortable here. Potentially the, uh, the air conditioners are, are, are kicking up and it's causing the air to move around. You can kind of feel the draft sitting in this environment. Um, so we may need to uh, consider changing how these uh, vents, maybe have the vents uh, push upward or something rather than just dumping <coughs> cold fluid onto, onto some of the people in these rooms. Okay. So just a couple extra little HVAC things that I wanted to show as well while I had this model up on the screen. Uh, all right, so that uh, I think covers the key points I want to make here. So I guess that at this stage, <coughs> we'll take a look at answering some questions. So one, uh, one of the questions that came in, is there any recommended CFD simplification for a corrugated tube inner wall geometry for internal flow? So to some extent, you might be able to get away with modeling, uh, modeling that as with a roughness factor. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the generally recommended approach. I would have to test it, to be honest. Um, so there's uh, when when you what am I talking about with roughness? Uh, when you're specifying a study or while you're when you're setting up the study, it's part of the uh, uh, where we have that. It's under wall conditions here. You can key in a roughness here, and uh, the large value you key in is going to contribute in turbulent scenarios. You're going to contribute more to the pressure drop. So you might be able to scale this parameter to mimic uh, a uh, corrugated uh, tube. Um, probably the initial way that I would handle it would be uh, to sort of model the, what's the minimum minimum diameter of the cor corrugated tube. You know, the corrugation's uh, sort of 
reduce the diameter. I'd probably model that minimum diameter because then the regions where uh, the, the larger diameter regions are, there's just stagnated flow probably in those regions. So they're, they're just behaving kind of like a, a, a wall in a way. So I don't think they're contributing much. So that'd probably be the initial way I'd model it, but and I'd model just maybe a small subsect, a small subsection of that corrugated tube, and experiment with that, see if I can get good results, and then uh, start scaling it up if I find that the roughness works pretty well, or um, or if there's some other approach to it. But uh, hopefully that's a little bit helpful. I know it, I don't have the a full detailed answer on that. I would have to experiment. Um, there were some other questions. Okay, the. Uh, Regarding the thermal plots shown for results comparison porous versus heat sink, was the heat sink section plot done through a fin or between? It was done between fins. The uh, heat sink section plot was done between fins. So that's, uh, I think, uh, part of the reason why you do see such a big difference between the porous media and the uh, heat sink is just because the porous media is just sort of averaging across all of that region, whereas the heat sink is actually, you have a higher velocity in, in between fins and then essentially no velocity where there is a fin. So. Um, that's why you see such a large local difference. So hopefully that helps to answer that uh, concern or question. If there's any other questions, feel free to put them in uh, the questions box here. Kind of pull that out here. See if. All right. So I think that that was about all of them. Let me. Uh, but if you do have any further questions, feel free to uh, shoot us an email. Um, my email, if, you're, if your question is technical, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, sean at decide-solutions.com. Um, if it's more uh, generic or more, more uh, on the sales-oriented uh, side, then uh, you shoot an email to Dave Leahy at d, d Leahy at decide-solutions.com. So thanks for coming, and uh, sorry about the uh, delay a little bit earlier there, but hopefully you got a lot out of it. Take care.